this time I'd like to introduce today's speakers, Gus Chingala, President and CEO of Project Assistance. Gus founded Project Assistance in 1996 with the goal of transforming our client's approach to portfolio and project management to achieve a standard of excellence in execution that consistently delivers expected project outcomes. Recognized portfolio and project management expert, Gus is a published author of many popular articles and books on the subject and frequently asked to present on this subject. You'll let me passing it off to Noreen, who is our uh, product manager here for staffing services. And this is our first time inviting Noreen to discuss her staffing services uh, and her second time with this team. So we're very excited to have her here to present. So I'll pass it on to our first speaker, Gus. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Noreen. And thanks, everybody who's attending today and taking your valuable time to uh, hear the message. So our agenda is pretty simple. Uh, we're going to talk about leadership in uh, roles in the context of projects. Uh, we're then going to go into uh, what we see uh, our customers need, what your need is, and how you define that. We'll then move on to how you can fulfill those needs and and, have, and, and, and who can do this, right? So um, we'll, we'll leave some time at the end for question and answers. And so when we talk about project leadership roles and context, what we mean by that is, is kind of the framework, right? The context that, that we think of here is the context of portfolio and project management. Uh, how, how do we bring together portfolios, programs, and projects with really three sets of methodologies. At the top of the pyramid is, is the portfolio management methodology, which really identifies opportunities to improve the organization, uh, to fulfill its mission, to fulfill the strategy, and the governance that, that oversees uh, the execution of strategy. Uh, and then at the execution layer below that, we really have two sets of methodologies. We have the project management, which delivers on time, on budget or what I would call the science of business controls. And on the left hand side we call life cycle management and it's the science of what I call making stuff, uh, building, designing and building and delivering the deliverables. And there are a variety of life cycle uh, methodologies. We're going to use two examples first and then I'll go into a, a broader chart that shows uh, even some more examples. And, and so when we think about, for example, information technology, when, we, when we, we go away from this idea of the generic life cycle methodologies and more specific to IT methodologies like systems development or software development life cycles or even within that what we would call the traditional waterfall methodology versus the uh, more contemporary agile and scrum methodologies or uh, going into the infrastructure side, the ITIL or the ITSM, uh, Information Technology Service uh, Management. So, so we really have two sets of methodologies at the point of execution and typically we have uh, two sets of owners, right? So what we're seeing here from a leadership standpoint, who leads uh, the, or the, let's say is most expert and, and has the subject matter expertise for delivering on time and on budget and we see these titles of program managers and project managers and schedulers and project administrators. When we go to the, uh, the subject matter experts for really overseeing the design, build and implementation of the deliverables, we see leaders on that side that look like business analysts uh, database analysts, solution architects, and, and you'll see as we get into some of the needs for these kinds of roles that these are these are uh, uh, skill areas that go beyond pure technical skills that get into uh, what we call what we call leadership, the soft skills, how we how we become successful by not only having our uh, finely tuned technical skills around on time, on budget, and on spec but also how do we take that theory as, as it stands, let's say, on, on uh, book knowledge and really apply that in real situations. We also see at the bottom of the pyramid development, QA, documentation, and we would call that technical execution. 
So when, when, once we have the, the design spec uh, defined, how do we actually start doing the building? Uh, another example we talk about is, is the uh, pharmaceutical or the life sciences industry. Okay, so in this case, again, just some examples at the point of execution, we would see subject matter experts on the on time, on budget side of the methodology, which would be clinical trials managers, program managers, project managers, schedulers, project administrators, or in this case, uh, a lot of times what we see, for example, in IT, the IT project managers would have grown up oftentimes uh, in their profession through the ranks of the information technology uh, organization. Uh, when we go to life sciences, we see a similar path where if I'm a clinical trials manager, there's a good chance I was something like a bench chemist or I oversaw uh, the uh, clinical trials themselves or maybe medical writing to, to do the documentation for the uh, Federal Drug Administration, or I'm sorry, the Food and Drug Administri Administration. And then we see on the R&D side, we, you know, instead of seeing the, 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 the DBAs and the solution architects, we really see kind of the drug architects, right? Clinical research analysts, uh, uh, clinic, uh, uh, clinical research organizations, study directors, medical affairs directors, and again, these are the people who have the expertise to define how you design, build, and test uh, compounds or, or large molecules that are effective in the life sciences. Again, at the point of execution from the, uh, from the scientific application, we see, again, the medical writers, the data analysts, the clinicians, the QA, clinical researchers, uh, CRAs, all those things. Okay, on a broader scale, again, when we're talking about leadership, we again are looking at uh, you, what I call the vertical methodology on time, on budget, project management, the business controls. We see that cutting across all of these, uh, what I call application areas. So, so uh, the application of product development, including life sciences, the application of IT methods, they're the, they're the two we already covered. Other examples would be architectural engineering and design. We would have leaders on the, uh, the project management side. We, have, we would have leaders on the, the literally the architecting side. How, how do you erect uh, steel uh, structures that hold up a 50-story building? Uh, aerospace and defense, and aeronautical engineering, and, and many of the related sciences to that. And the other one is vision, vision initiatives, which is a no, another whole set of methodology. Some examples of that would be uh, things like large capital projects, mergers and acquisitions, organizational change management. Um, I call them sometimes corporate initiatives, uh, but the kinds of things we would see uh, that really happen at the direct point of execution for corporate strategies. So I'll, I'll introduce this topic of what you need. You know, if you, if you know what you want, half the battle is won. So, so a very important part uh, for us is to really understand the need and to help um, uh, for us as a provider, um, how, we, how we can help our customers really do a great job of identifying the need because that's a big deal. It's a very big deal to be clear about what you want. So how can, how can you be clear about what you need? And really what we're talking about here is um, what are the challenges, right? So here's, here is a, uh, an example of the kinds of challenges we see in our client base and are we doing a poll on this, Dan? Okay. So uh, I'm gonna. So we're gonna put a poll out there to keep you awake today, and um, take it away, Dan. Do I start it or do you start it? It's up. Okay. I don't, oh, I don't get the vote. That's right. That's why I'm not seeing it. Okay. I'll give you about 30 seconds to read down these uh, six options. Okay. So we have. So what's so do I see the survey result? You're going to tell me the survey results. Uh, unclear requirements and ineffective providers were in the leading. Interesting. Unclear requirements and ineffective providers. I think I have to agree. Uh, certainly, you know, from from our perspective as as a provider, uh, we certainly would would talk about unclear requirements, and we will talk about that. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, that will be one of the first things uh, I talk about once I 
uh, take the floor back from the rain of a few slides. So um, yeah, so so what do you need, right? Do you have do you have clear requirements? Um, how important um, is industry experience? Um, which pro project focus areas, and we'll go in deeper into that. What we mean by project focus areas? Uh, does the budget match what the marketplace demands? That's that's a big one. Um, sometimes that said is that you know I get a champagne uh, taste and a beer budget kind of thing. Um, and what type of engagement? You know, are we gonna uh, we're trying to find, hire full time people. We want uh, tech the perm. We want um, uh, maybe our hourly consultants uh, or some other votes that we'll talk about uh, pretty soon. So at this moment, uh, is there any, uh, I was going to ask you anything to say, but I'm going to give it to Noreen anyhow. I'm going to I'm going to uh, toss this over to my colleague Noreen Hackman and um, take it down uh, deeper through this process. So setting clear requirements that was one of the concerns that you had. Here at Project Assistance, we're all about processes and procedures. We actually have a form that we utilize um, anytime we're working with a client so that we're capturing that information up front. That's one of the main reasons why firms uh, miss the mark the first time is that they don't have a clear set of requirements. So if you want a quick turnaround with precision, you need to provide the uh, recruiting firm with all the appropriate information. It's not just the title or a job description and the responsibility, but the level of experience. Are you looking for someone junior or senior? Um, what's the target start date? If it's a contract staff augmentation, what's your hourly rate? If it's permanent placement or contract to hire, what's the base salary? If there is a bonus associated with it as well. Travel is a key concern to many candidates and consultants. What's the percentage of the travel? Where is the assignment, the location? It may not be at the headquarters. It may be in a satellite office. Um, if it's consulting, the length or the contract, the length of the assignment, do you have to have a certain degree or a certain certification? Is a PMP required? Do you need a certified scrum um, individual? What software systems do they need to have? Core skills, those things that are a must have, any nice to have skills um, as well. And then the person that I'm talking to over the phone from the client, are you the hiring manager? and getting that pertinent information. It's critical for permanent placement. These candidates are slow to move. They need to know why is the position open? What's the company culture? What's the benefits package? You need to be prepared and have that information ready and available. <laughs> Industry experience and project focus areas. A lot of clients think that they have to have the industry experience. And yes, that is the case for most, but it's also very critical for project um, experience. Are you looking for somebody who has application development, agile experience? Are they working on a business initiative for you? Or are you needing someone with mergers and acquisitions? Some of these can transcend industries. Data system migration, and I can kind of go down through the list, whether you need somebody to help build out a PML for you, or do they need to have professional services, as well as R&D projects. So there's a plethora of projects. They may need to be in certain industries that will help you um, gain the value with a certain consultant, while the project focus may be more critical for you as well. In regards to budget, that's the word of the day. Budget is definitely key. A majority of the clients are truly unaware of what the market rate are for project administrators versus business analysts versus a seasoned um, PML executive or portfolio manager. We all are looking for a bargain, but at what cost? Do you sacrifice quality for savings? 
typically clients will come to us, you know, their project has gone off the rails, um, they're missing deadlines because they sacrifice quality versus the savings. Then we need to bring in a professional um, project manager to help get their project back on track. So I tell clients all the time, the rule of thumb, you really want to stick close to market rate, but you have to have an honest conversation with the staffing firm regarding your budget. Tip at project assistance, this is generally what we provide out to our clients. Starting from the bottom, the project coordinators, schedulers, project and administrators. Um, the cost to the client is give or take approximately 100 per hour. Project managers with anywhere between three to 10 years of experience as well as project leaders, we're talking 125 give or take. Now we're talking 10, 10 to 20 years senior project managers, program managers, portfolio managers, and PMO directors at 150 per hour. Now, the plus and minus is there. It's really due to the location, geographic, project assistance is across the nation. So it depends, are you in the New York rate, won't apply to a Tennessee rate, but if you need to have certain degrees, whether they need to be a subject matter expert, and you're in a rural area that doesn't have a plethora of that, be prepared. You may need to bring candidates outside of your area. Now you're getting paying for travel expenses, room and board, so that rate may go up. Are these individuals going to be traveling to your client site? Will they be needing to stay temporarily um, three to six months near your organization to meet your corporate objectives. Certain certifications, do they need their PMP? Do they need their Scrum Master Certificate? Do these people also have to have Masters? That will also affect the rate as well. The typical engagement options that we run into are what some companies call hourly contracts um, for staff augmentation is another term. The other is contract to hire um, for attempt to firms. That's when you bring the person in at an hourly rate and after a designated time, they get converted over to a full-time employee of yours. Um, the third is permanent placement where you pay the on a contingency basis the staffing firm a fixed dollar amount based off of the base salary. You can also do executive or retained search as well. And last but not least is managed services with an SLA. So how do you get there? Um, you know, what part of the staffing process does your organization struggle with? So everyone wants to optimize best practices for staffing. You need to take a hard look internally. Is it that are we not giving the requirements up front to our recruiters and not giving them all of the information? Um, finding the best fit from initial field, that's, a, that's the one that most companies struggle with. And what we mean by that is this. If the individual, whether it's the recruiter or one of the line managers, are they able to read a candidate's resume and interpret the information from that resume to determine are they the right fit? That's where most people lack that transition of skill, to be able to read a candidate's resume and determine from reading the resume, would it be a good fit? Do they have the experience? The next is the interview process. Are you doing an initial phone screen? Are you doing a first round, a second round? Um, or is it going to be face to face? Are you going to be doing a panel interview? Um, and who's going to be providing that technical part of the interview process? That's what needs to be determined. The flip side of that is, is someone prepare, um, prepping that candidate for the interview. So when they go in, they're clearly able to articulate their skills that apply directly to your 
job spec so that you have a clear understanding if they have the necessary skills to do this job successfully. Onboarding is a challenge for some people. Are the reference checks done? Are the background checks done properly? Is someone setting up the workspace, having a laptop and an ID? A lot of times, consultants will go in. I ask them how the first day went, and they're like, great. I finally got a place to sit, and tomorrow I'm hoping I'm getting the laptop. Well, you're paying for that consultant to be sitting there. Let's get all the ducks in a row. Make sure on day one they're being able to hit the ground running within your organization. Uh, last but not least, effectively applying the talent. Once you have that candidate in there, incorporate them into the team, incorporate them into the company culture. I'm constantly in contact with my candidate, asking how the first day went, asking how the first week went, talking to them every other week or at least on a monthly basis. Also, I'm reaching out on the client side, seeing how that first week went with that candidate, following up monthly with them, having lunches, really getting to have a team atmosphere so that this person can get blended seamlessly within the organization. They're much more effective that way. How to get it? We have a step-by-step -step process. You want to communicate the process clearly to your recruiter or your staffing firm so they understand it. Give them clear. Or your internal HR if you're not using staffing firms. Correct. And define the requirements and so that everyone knows all that information up front. You're going to get better results and quicker results. The next step is to initiate the search. If you're using your internal HR, are they going out to posting it on Dice, Career Builder, Monster, Indeed as well, LinkedIn. Um, then once you get all the resumes, you're going to review them. You're going to compare them. Who's going to do the review? who's going to do the comparison, um, and how do you go about selecting them for a follow-up. The next process is to prepare the candidate for the interview. Um, if you're using internal HR, they need to communicate the individuals within your organization that they'll be speaking. Let them do some prep work on your organization and see who they're going to be speaking. They're, reach, they're looking at that person on LinkedIn, getting a good understanding so when they go in for the interview that they can articulate their skills and be able to build rapport with these individuals. I also um, have found that, um, especially since the, the global financial meltdown, that um, it used to be that good people weren't on the market. There, there are still some good people out there that are unemployed. And um, unemployed people are pretty nervous, right? So, so when we prepare a candidate, we remind them um, that they have great skills. I mean, if we've selected them, we're 99% we're sure that these are pretty talented people. Uh, nervous people tend to ramble. And, and so we, we try to remind people to keep your chin up and to be confident. Uh, you know, oftentimes, it's a 30-minute screen, so you got Somebody who wants to ask 30 questions, and you know, if you give five-minute answers, they're not going to get their 30 questions in, and that makes the whole interview ineffective. So, you know, we get some sort of some basic um, standard questions uh, or standard standard uh, uh, support to our candidates, and then of course, of course, in addition to what Noreen is talking to, very specific to who they're talking to. Uh, big uh, culture is a big deal. Right, so uh, we uh, have had some interesting experiences with, for example, trying to take people out of high-paced corporate uh, positions, and and they want to go into uh, nonprofits. Well, those cultures sometimes are, are pretty different. So, um, you know, and even if we think the candidate can transition to a different culture, it certainly helps to uh, coach. Uh, people who are situational, you know, great leaders are very situational and can can sort of uh, modify their behavior 
and uh, to be appropriate to the situation. But sometimes they need to be reminded of what the environment is. They may be they may be talking to ten different opportunities this week, and they forget they're going into a university where uh, collaboration is a lot more um, acceptable and, and expected than uh, being a financial institution on Wall Street, maybe. Very good advice, Gus. Um, now let's conduct the interview. So usually in the interview process, it's multi-step. Um, is it an initial phone screen with uh, internal HR, or is it an initial phone screen with the hiring manager? Once they move past that, are you doing a first round face-to-face? -face? Sometimes, you know, the best candidate is not local. So you need to also think about doing Skype or a webcast with them. Typically, the second round of interviews will be um, at the corporate location with multiple individuals. You need to determine up front who's going to be in that round because it's, it's the C-level executive, it's very hard to get them in. Um, so you may want to be scheduling the best way is to have all your candidates come in on one day, lock out the time, do a round robin. Then you're able to compare one candidate to the second candidate to your third candidate. And those candidates are fresh in everyone's mind. At the end of the day, you can close out and evaluate uh, those candidates. In regards to how about selecting the right candidate, it's not just selecting the right candidate, and looking to extend an offer to them. But in this day and age, especially for permanent placement, be prepared that there's going to the, the potential for the counter offer. And who handles that? Is that your internal HR going to be um, extending the offer to the candidate? And the candidate comes back and says, I don't know. Uh, my current company just gave me a $10,000 raise. Are you prepared for that? I deal with this all the time. So when I'm working with a client, I've already predetermined with the candidate um, what they're looking for for a base salary, um, if there's any wiggle room. And we've already had a conversation, a deep conversation about if you are offer a counter offer, what's your answer going to be? So I'm typically three to four steps ahead of that. I don't wait for the candidates to come back and tell me that they have one. I expect it up front and we're already diffusing that situation ahead of time. Then we conduct the post-decision process. Once again, that's just dealing with if there's a counter offer, do you come back and offer more money? Is there wiggle room on the benefits that you can offer this particular candidate? Will they? Is there a, a, a one-time bonus that you provide to them, or are they looking for additional vacation? And are you able to do that for them? Are they also looking for additional money spent for training and education? Can you provide that with that for them? So those are some of the, um, um, the post-decision process. And what happens is if you extend it, you go through that whole interview process, they accept the offer, and now you're doing the background check and it fails. What next? Do you have that contingency set up for who is your replacement candidate? And has that replacement candidate already accepted another offer and moved on? Working with a staffing firm, I'm always keeping that person on hold. I keep that individual warm until the client comes back to me and has said that the first candidate is a go and I know that they've walked in day one to the organization. I never assume everything's going to run smoothly. I'm always prepared uh, to have, see these bumps in the road and to help avoid those bumps in the road. Is your HR keeping that other candidate, your backup candidate, warm if your first candidate falls through? Anything else that you can add to that, Gus? No, I think I think that's pretty comprehensive. I mean, there's always uh, um, 
the risk of losing a great candidate, and I think you, you pointed out some good ideas for how we can um, sort of be prepared for that, and, and you know, it happens, right? I mean, the, the most frustrating thing for us is really oftentimes is uh, from the time of, you know, if we look at this whole process, where's the challenge, right? There's this, um, the big challenge we see is the, the amount of time that elapses from the getting the requirement to, uh, usually we can go from the requirement to the, to the uh, submission of candidates fairly quickly. Uh, the time that goes from the time we get a great candidate till the time they get interviewed, that we get feedback and a decision is made, um, is, is kind of the most challenging part for us. And, and what's, what's really sort of hard to deal with is, is the, um, the time when we're losing candidates due to the organization unable to keep the time going. And, you know, usually our customers are pretty aware of that, but uh, any, you know, if we, if we could fix anything in the process, we would see uh, that the best candidates uh, aren't lost uh, to competitive offers. And that's, a, and that's a challenge for a lot of uh, clients in regards to staff augmentation or contract uh, hourly consultants is that if, it's not, if they're not quickly turning around and providing feedback to the recruiting firms or even the internal HR is not reply, providing feedback timely to these uh, hourly consultants, they're off and they take another position. And now you've lost the best person because you're not communicating with them. Right. Yeah. And the other, you know, a lot of a lot of candidates are, uh, if they're taking hourly consulting, um, most have most, not all, but most have the preference of having a full-time job with a salary. Um, even if even if we can pay them a full-time job with a salary, um, uh, oftentimes they would rather work for you than for us, frankly. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so so. You know, we encourage our customers to be very open with the idea of if they're coming in hourly, that the organization is open that if, if, if they prove themselves to be great to be great consultants, that there that there is if there if there is to, to be able to share that that uh, a, a full time placement may be there at the end of the contract or there's an extension on the contract that gives us and you. A competitive advantage with that candidate against other opportunities where maybe that possibility is not on the table. So we we really do encourage our customers to have that open mindedness. You know, most of our customers would love to keep great people if they can. And you know, we we encourage it because our consultants become customers. So, so we hate to see a great candidate uh, sort of leave our payroll, but we certainly um, see the you know the benefit paying it forward down the road. Okay. So the next slide is who can deliver it, and I think this is was one of the other responses where the, the poll for the clients were having challenges is the staffing providers were ineffective and they needed improvement. Where do they need improvement? Well, the skills mismatch. So in other words, is that they're not able to interpret a job requirement or a job spec and provide you with the best candidate. Why is that? Because most of them are dealing with a plethora of all different IT positions, not just projects and portfolio management. They're doing uh, JavaScript. They're doing uh, customer help desk, uh, customer relations, any and every hardware, software, uh, data uh, systems and data migrations. They're doing it all. But with us, we just work with we don't have that challenge here because we're project management and portfolio management. So we have a really good, a deep understanding with seasoned, experienced project managers. So we're able to take a client's job requirement, interpret it, and provide them with the exact skill set that they need. Speed. You know, if you don't have a list of candidates, um, and a candidate matrix filled out, it's going to take you longer to turn around and provide a resume. 
Typically, it should be within 24 to 48 hours of providing resumes to a client based off of a job spec. So as soon as I get that initial call from the client, uh, and as long as I have everything clearly defined up front, I'm able to provide them with resumes within 24 to 48 hours. The availability of the talent, this comes down to they're doing too many things at once. So the, what the, the recruiting firm will say is like, oh, I can't, you know, I don't have anybody. What they're really trying to say is, is that this is not their expertise. Project management uh, or this particular position is not their expertise. So they don't have those relationships. I've been in the business for over seven years. Project assistance has been in business for over 20 years. Uh, we had, uh, we're involved with the PMI, we're involved with GP SAG. There are multiple organizations. We're deeply connected within the Philadelphia, greater Philadelphia area, um, and no lots of talent out there, and I'm quickly able, if I don't have the talent, I go to my list of consultants and I can get referrals instantaneously. The last one we so have. The other thing I would add just real quickly is talk about the connections in the Philadelphia area. The, you know, the other thing that, um, the thing that took us national was um, something we did a few years ago, which was taking our leadership workshop out to um, really to, to all the major PMI chapters and it was kind of interesting how many times even the chapter president of PMI uh, got pretty interested. We'd have a, we'd had a number of um, PMI chapters who um, have hosted our leadership workshop, have uh, invited their own members to it and, and what that means is you know we, we're, we're a phone call away from many of the, uh, the leaders in the PMI chapters throughout the country uh, and even in Canada, I mean, I did a, uh, a leadership uh, presentation, a uh, keynote presentation for Project World and BA World up in Toronto. So we have our uh, Project Excel uh, brand up in Canada, and we have, uh, uh, have a national presence as well uh, outside of the Philadelphia area. Um, pricing, that's the one that stumps everybody. But if you have a good rapport with your candidate, and the consultant, you're able to negotiate their rate um, and work with the client. Okay, everyone's budget is not going to be perfect. We get that. But there's got to be concessions on all three sides. It's what makes a perfect win, it's not a win-win situation, it's a win-win-win situation. The candidate's got to be walking away feeling pretty happy. The client's got to feel good about the budget, and the recruiter or the HR needs to feel good with the pricing as well. So if you have a strong relationship with your candidates and you utilize them um, multiple times, they're more than willing to work with you with, um, on a rate. I have lots of conversations with the candidates that I deal with. I explain the situation to them. Um, they're always looking for the highest dollar, but the highest dollar doesn't get them that per, um, position. I tell them about the benefits of that organization. I have to sell you, the client, the client to the candidate, just like I have to sell the candidate to the client. People aren't just going to want it for a permanent placement. Candidates aren't going to want to just jump ship from one company that they've known well for the last three years and go to the unknown your organization. I have to talk about the pluses of them making that move and that they may need to concede a little bit on their base salary to go to a better working environment, a better culture, a better fit, um, an opportunity for advancement, and that, that may mean that it takes a hit on their base salary. The other thing is, is that when I'm talking to a consultant on an hourly rate and they're used to getting paid X and I'm like, well, no, the budget for this is Y, but let me tell you the pluses of, of the reason why you need to take that reduced rate 
with this client because it's exposing more of a certain skill set or expanding the certain skill set or giving you another venue or a different industry. It's building out your resume and it will only enhance your resume. Or the, I turn it around and say, look, you've got the great skills. You work for a large corporation. This younger, uh, smaller company needs someone like you with your skill set. And when you compliment a candidate on how well they performed in the past, they're more than likely and being very gracious that they're willing to work with you on an hourly rate. But it takes a very savvy recruiter to be able to negotiate rates with candidates and getting them to see the pluses of being flexible with the rate for a client. Anything else to add, Gus? No, that's good. That's great stuff, Mary. Does that mean it's my turn now? Yes, take it away. Okay, so we were we were talking about uh, you know what uh, what questions might we add, uh, ask to our uh, or what questions you might ask to your providers, your partners, including your internal uh, staffing and recruiting folks, as well as firms like Project Assistance, right? So um, so the day is us, right? Ask your provider. Um, how do they aim for the bullseye or, or just do a resume dump, right? How, how, how do we as providers demonstrate to you that we're saving you time because we really are pretty close to the bullseye and therefore instead of getting 10 resumes, you get two or one or three really top talents that are really on the mark. Um, you know, how, how, do, how do you challenge your providers um, to vet out leadership skills versus project results? Right, so or technical skills versus leadership skills. Um, uh, do does your provider have uh, subject matter experts on the topic of project management? You know, how how do you understand uh, if a project manager is effective um, if you haven't been a project manager yourself? Right, so this is not something you pick up in a book. Uh, it's something you know where you get real battle scars and, and understand the profession. Uh, how about a QA process? You know, how how does the provider um, really become proactive in heading off trouble before you have to be even be involved? And uh, that's a tricky move. So I'll talk about a few of these things. You know, when we when we first get called from a, from a new customer, we talk to them with what we call the six inch bullseye. This idea that uh, you know we're kind of testing our customers too, right? You know, I, I talked about the challenges earlier. When Noreen was going through the process of the time lags between the initial requirement and the uh, the decision to uh, screen a candidate, the decision to have feedback on a candidate, um, to make a decision on a candidate, um, so we ask for responsiveness, and usually times, most times we'll get um, a yes, yes, we are responsive, but we test that right. So, the way we test that is, is we put real people in front of our customers pretty quickly uh, that are uh, mildly close to the, to the bullseye. That's why I call it a six inch bullseye. That's why you see those, those arrows in the graphic not quite in the center. Uh, the reason we do that is not only are we testing your responsiveness, but we're also um, testing clarifications. Right? We have found that as much as our customers try to give us very accurate requirements, Oftentimes we see by seeing a real human being with real skills with a mix that maybe you didn't even know existed in the market will trigger some additional thoughts. Were you going to say something, Noreen? You really want to hone in on, on those skills and that's when they actually see a resume and they're like, oh, well, yeah. And it can also take a job requirement off into a different direction. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the thing we focus on too, even even if it's a six inch bullseye, there's there's two screens. You know, it's not it's not read a resume and, and submit it and, and ask our customers to figure it out. Um, we try to be able to translate what's on the paper into what we're what, what we're seeing, and that comes really from initially from a recruiter um, who have, who understands what we do, but also to um, uh, Dan Dan introduced introduced me as the uh, CEO of the company, but I manage our Portfolio project management consulting practice. So I'm a practice manager, and uh, and I still I still do billable work. 
um, including our leadership workshop. Laureen is a, is a hands-on recruiter in addition to being uh, uh, the practice director for our recruiting team and, and, and our business development program. So, so you know, it's, it's having practitioners who have been around this thing for a long time really vetting things out, even though we're pretty sure that that, that resume is going or that requirement is going to get fine-tuned. We put our time in to save your time, and you should expect that, right? Um, you know, the second round, uh, and third or fourth, if necessary, we call it the one, the one inch bullseye, right? So uh, our screening becomes more fine-tuned when a we've gotten proof from the customer that the responsiveness is there, and we're not going to spend a ton of time uh, putting forth great candidates and have them be wasted by going to other opportunities due to lack of speed. Uh, the second thing is uh, that clarification, right? It's, it's, I would say, if I had to say percentage uh, of these things, you know, when we put a first round of candidates in there, one out of ten will not give us feedback at all. I can't uh, really understand why that happens. People have other priorities. They don't know that we're serious. Oh my God, they put in candidates. Maybe you know, now I'm not ready, or the money's not there for whatever reason. Some of our prospects will really not get back to us with any kind of feedback. So we're testing that. But I would say 50% or more, I don't know what, you're, what you'd say, Doreen, is, is when we put in real candidates in the first round, we get some feedback, oftentimes through rejections of resumes. No, that missed the mark. Well, why? And then we hear something that we didn't know. Yeah, we want, we want that IT project manager who's been around software development, uh, we want them to also have a scrub master certification. Oh, well, that's new. Okay, so now we go back to the same set of candidates and find that there was maybe some people in there that, that met those requirements as well. So you know. I, I do have one thing to add, and I didn't add it early. It's critical because it's your reputation, your branding of your company online. Um, on everything is now online. You need to respond back either to the candidate directly or to the recruiting firm. It leaves a bad taste in the candidate's mouth. And they will be bad mouthing you on social media, and you don't want that to happen. There are plenty of clients I could have gotten good candidates, but because they've heard so many bad things from uh, other folks and seen on social media, they don't even want to touch a client because of that. And I, and I would take that a step further. I mean, you know, it, it's a reflection on us. Um, with our candidates to, to put them in bad situations, right? So, so if we know an organization is uh, churning through uh, our candidates or churning through other other people's candidates, they, you know, they um, they're not sticking because it's a caustic environment. Hey, look, we expect our project managers to be in some tough situations, but but when it gets to you know counterproductive or um, uh, unethical and some other things that we see out there, uh, even the firms don't. I want to work with you, right? So, so we see that. Um, uh, we we certainly have uh, a list of companies that, frankly, we've tried to do business with, and and when we see um, uh, not only not responsiveness, but other ways they treat outside project managers, and that's a tough thing to do. You know, the when we're when we're looking at this, uh, you know, the second wave. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about not just the skills of a project manager, but we're talking about cultural fit. We're talking about uh, many other points of match, including scenario base, which we'll get into in a minute. So, yeah, so you see this, this last bullet here actually says scenario results based screening. And that really kind of gets to this. Uh, one of our main messages we put out there is what I call getting beyond the PMP. Right, uh, you know, I call it, I call it the price of admission. Um, you know, it demonstrates functional project management skills. It demonstrates an expertise and understanding of the book theory of the project management body of knowledge. Um, uh, it even shows process execution experience. You actually processed the, or executed the process. Now, okay, you executed the process, but the project's still failing. You know, how do we deal with this? And the way I describe project management is quite simple. In the project management is the art and science of, I'll talk about the science first, continually rethinking the plan with reality. Now, a lot of people, a lot of our stakeholders would really 
prefer that we sync reality to the plan. And that's the world that real project managers live in, that we know our job from a project management theory is to re-sync the plan with reality. The plan has to change, not the reality. Can we change reality? Abracadabra? Maybe. Usually not. So that's the science. But here's the art. In the face of resistance. Resyncing the plan with reality in the face of resistance. Our leadership workshop is based on a concept that we call predictable points of resistance. That when we have bad news, nobody wants to hear it. Okay? So, so we, what we do is scenario based. We, as a matter of fact, I have the same conversation I'm having now with our candidates about our leadership workshop and about the art and the science of project management and say, what's your style? What is your unique fingerprint? What is your honed constellation of unique skills against 55 different dimensions of leadership? Which ones work for you? What strengths do you bring to the table? And give me some real scenarios where a project was about to go off the rails, has gone off the rails maybe, and what have you done personally to get it back on the rails? How did you deal with the resistance? What are the tricks that you use? And I can tell you that it's hard to make up the answers that we get. And, 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 if, and if you're a seasoned project manager as I am, and been running a business like as I have been doing for a long time, what, what I say uh, here, is you know how do you how do you take all these you know sort of book ideas of leadership and turn it into a real evalu evaluation whether we have somebody who stands in the face of resistance and does the appropriate judgment the appropriate communication the appropriate situational cultural things that fit and and you know and apply it into leading projects as a matter of fact what I call this is. I, I, I describe my capability to judge these folks as having a hair trigger BS meter, right? That we just have uh, a reliable internal barometer, six cents gut that you just can't put down the paper. I had a customer say, we, you know, you said you've got this unique screening process. Can you share that with me? I said, I can, it's like me, it's like Tiger Woods handed me his driver. And because I think I'm going to pick that up and drive it 350 yards down the middle as well, and it just doesn't work that way, right? So, so a lot of this is really how do you really do a deeper investigation beyond the PMP, and that's really one of our greatest differentiators. And you should expect this for project managers, okay? So, so you know, do we have that ability to investigate leadership experience, review and clarify skills, roles, and requirements, right? How do we really get into that and make sure it's real? How do, you, how do you validate the stories uh, in the interview and the reference checks and match it to the realities of what this person really is? And, um, and um, you know, the other question is, do your providers bring a project manager methodology or at least project managers who can apply their situational awareness and capabilities to match and, and to mold to what your methodology looks like? That's part of the culture. Part of the culture is, is how good and oftentimes how bad your environment is for project managers, right? So the QA level is really this idea of being proactive, right? We have a practice led uh, by seasoned practitioners. You should expect that, right? Uh, you know, we should be able to bring a, uh, a best practice for uh, applying uh, project management and portfolio management, right? Proactive intervention, talking to, talking to the project managers uh, behind your back on your behalf. Right, to let them vent on us and, 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 and let them tell us that uh, maybe this project management office has been set up to fail. And how do we, how do we help you? How do we tactfully tell you your baby's ugly and we need to do something about it? Now, we judge that, right? Is, is your environment going to be ideal? Absolutely not. So we also have to judge, hey, project manager, suck it up and let's, let's, let's be successful in the face of adversity, or there's no way we can be successful in this environment. How do we intervene? With options and recommendations. Okay, so so our you know our overall mission is is um, you know to deliver the future into the present through effective project management, and we do some other things with um, uh, we're a Microsoft partner. You know we're, we're experts on Microsoft Project. My Project 2016 book will be out I think in March this month. Um, we have an upfront. Uh, vision and roadmap uh, offering. We have process improvement for methodology. We do, uh, as I mentioned, PPM solution selection and, and implementation, which in our world is Microsoft Project, Project Online, Office 365. Training on leadership, Microsoft Project, 
project management theory, requirements management, risk management, all those things. Okay, so this is really just a picture of what we just talked about. These are uh, this is really just a, a one pager of what we what we talked about today. This is what we do. Um, if you are interested uh, in project management uh, careers, uh, please let us know. Uh, by the way, our next uh, webinar, oops, this slide, you know, I opened the wrong slide, sorry, May 22nd, uh, is going to be on Microsoft Projects, so I'll skip over that since that's incorrect. And uh, we are uh, a minute from 4 o'clock, I think. We're right at 4 o'clock. Did we have uh, anybody from the audience stand that has any questions? We do actually have uh, one question so far. Um, does project assistants train their project managers? Uh, yes, we do. Now, you know, one of the things is, is kind of the situational on the ground at the client, what we just talked about. There's a real situation uh, that our project manager maybe doesn't know how to handle. You know, uh, our, our project managers realize when they're, for example, screening with Noreen and I as practice managers, uh, that we've got a pretty serious expertise. I try not to be intimidating uh, with my questions, but I also try to create credibility so that they know that there's somebody they can come to. So there's a kind of a situational training where we have uh, highly skilled project managers who still need some help, but we also do a uh, uh, on-site in our clients, in our what we call our, our project manager community of practice. Our leadership um, workshop is on the road with our client sites right now. Um, so we deliver our leadership in three brown bag lunches at three different client locations, and all of our other project managers, from both from project assistants and from our customers, are invited to those events. Um, and there's there's other examples uh, I can get into, but uh, they're the two primary ones. Is, is sort of the ongoing road show uh, that I lead out into our customers and, and invite our communities to be involved in that. We also have our training materials available uh, to our project managers uh, on demand. We are officially in every time, so, but we still have some attendees here, so uh, we're always willing to give more content as long as you're willing to stay. So we'll, we'll we have another question here. Uh, are staffing providers able to provide PMs across multiple industries? It's a good question. I guess you know we talked about industries, and then we talked about um, I didn't use the term yet, but I, I what I usually answer that is is its application areas, right? So when we were uh, way way back on um, on the slide that, that talked about the uh, the applications of product development, uh, IT. Uh, architectural engineering, design, aerospace, corporate initiatives, they're the, they're, the, they're the architectural methodologies that our architects are, are, are expected to be experts in. But our project managers, um, our, or our project management judgment skills, I guess I would say, is the ability to apply those same project management principles across a wide variety of application areas, whether it is product development, whether it's IT, whether it's architectural design and those other examples we use, it's very important for us to be able to judge whether these folks have really worked in those application areas and understand it. My favorite example is IT professional services. You hire an IT professional services firm to implement SAP in your organization, or you have an internal team that has SAP skills. If you look at how project management is applied in those two different areas, it's very different. Right, the SAP consultants count in hours and dollars, and the internal organization oftentimes doesn't track hours at all. Right, so I call that cost center project management versus revenue or profit center project management, and they're different. A clinical research organization acts like a professional services organization. Even though they're doing clinical trials, they'll act very differently than the internal clinical uh, researchers are. So, so we have to be aware of that. And, and so it, it, I'll even see one more example, then I'll stop. IT project managers who have installed clinical trial systems versus clinical trials managers who have run clinical trials. We get a pharmaceutical that wants somebody to run clinical trials. We get resumes from somebody who's installed internal IT systems for clinical trials management. Probably not a match. Even though they know the language, probably not what the pharmaceutical is looking for. So we have to be able to to sort of discern 
uh, and, and, and help sort out, again, saving time for our customers so that we're bringing the right candidates to the table and, and really reducing the cycle time. All right, that's all the questions we had come in today. So thank you everyone so much for joining us. Uh, we'll be following up with you with what we call our parting gifts uh, via email. That includes a, a lot of good, valuable stuff. We're not just saying that. It's, it's the <laughs> PDFs for the slides that you just saw today. Uh, so you can access that whenever you'd like. Um, it's a recording for the webinar also, if you'd like our voices to accompany those slides yet again. Um, we, it's a coupon code for our training guide uh, for Microsoft Project, um, uh, directions on how to follow up on the PDUs, uh, etc. So we'll be following up with you on that. And thank you so much again. And thank you on behalf of Gus and Maureen. Thanks so much for presenting. And have a great afternoon. Thank, thank you. you.